greatest greater welcome to go downstairs and be like for Junior Church. I couldn't hear it again. It's all right. The rest of us just take your Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Galatians, chapter 5. In uh, 1911, Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham is not a Disney character. Mordecai Ham was an evangelist. It was his real name. His last name was Ham. Been named after I think it was an uncle or a, a grandfather, great uncle or something. Mordecai Ham, who had actually been uh, he'd been saved. He'd been called to preach. He started preaching. Uh, out of business. He actually had a business, closed down the business, and went into full-time evangelism. Uh, during his lifetime, he held over three, or around 300 evangelistic meetings. And uh, the, according to records, he saw over 300,000 people come to trust Christ as their Savior during his ministry. Now, Mordecai Ham was preaching a, a meeting in 1911 uh, on the subject of God's grace. Well, unbeknownst to him, in that service was a man. Get my hymn book out here because I want to look at it. There was a man in the audience or in the congregation that night that had killed four men. Mordecai Ham preached on. And he started yelling. Saved, saved. He got that excited. Well, in the service was also Jack Schofield. Schofield not, has nothing to do with the Schofield Bible. Jack Schofield was actually Mordecai Ham's song leader, his music man. When that man got up and started yelling after his salvation, saved, saved, saved. friend who's all to me his love is ever true I love to tell how he lifted me and what his grace can do for you saved by his power divine saved to new life sublime life now is sweet and my joy is complete for I'm saved 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 that's the story of how the song came into existence a man who got saved, and the fruit of the Spirit, joy, entered into his life. Can I ask you a question, and that is this. You say you believe in God. You say believe in Jesus Christ. Is there enough evidence in your life to convict you if that was a crime? Well, one of the evidences of true salvation is joy. Now, I'm not talking about happiness, I'm talking about joy. The Bible records the word happiness 26 times. However, the Bible records the word joy 330 times. Happiness is something that happens by chance. Joy is something that happens by choice. It's something that you choose to do. Happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is based on your relationship with Jesus Christ. I wanted this morning for a few moments, I want you to look at Galatians chapter 5. As a launching off point again, look at verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, and what's the next part? Joy. joy. Love and joy. Now what makes this kind of joy? Have you ever known somebody that was really, really joyful? I mean, somebody who really, truly had joy. I heard me tell years ago of an illustration. I, have not, I don't use it often, but I've used it more than once. There was a, a wonderful lady. Her name was Ruthie. My dad used to go into homes, not seniors, apartment complexes, though he would have loved to have done that. Back in my, my, when I was a kid, apart, senior apartment complexes were few and far between, but nursing homes were quite common. And uh, my dad would go into the nursing homes and he would hold Bible studies or services, if you will. And one 
And in that, in that nursing home was a woman by the name of Ruthie. Now, Ruthie was not an old woman. As a matter of fact, she was probably in her early 30s. But Ruthie had had a debilitating form of, of, of arthritis. It was so bad that, uh, matter of fact, I, I rarely saw anything other than Ruthie's head and her hands. But there were a couple of times that I did see her uncovered as far as she, you know, obviously not in, in an immodest way, but normally they had a blanket over her because of the fact that Ruthie, this type of debilitating arthritis that she had, she had literally, her, her legs were drawn up underneath uh, literally, you can picture somebody in a fetal position. She, Ruthie was in the fetal position all the time. Her knees were drawn up under her and her hands were like this. And I can remember one of her hands was, was turned way inside and she could not move her joints. Because to move her joints, she would have been in excruciating pain from the, from the moving of the joints. And I, I remember going into that nursing home with my dad for years. I watched Ruthie week after week after week that my dad would go in there and have a, have a service. And my dad would go over to Ruthie. He'd reach down and he'd grab her hand and he'd, he'd shake her hand. Now, I will tell you this. Some people, you do not ask them how they're doing. Because they'll tell you. Now, don't, I don't mean that in the wrong sense. I mean, they're going to tell you the absolute truth. How you doing today? Well, okay, I guess. My dad didn't have a problem asking Ruthie. Ruthie always had the same answer. She'd say, just praise in the Lord. There was a joy in her face. Folks, that was 40 years ago. I can still to this day picture Ruthie's face. I can still see the smile on her face. I think it was permanently etched onto her face. Because I don't, I honestly, week after week, month after month, year after year, I never remember Ruthie not smiling. Now maybe it was the arthritis, maybe it, you know. I don't know. I never heard Ruthie ever one time ever complain. Even though she had to have been in excruciating pain. She may not have had happiness, but she had joy. Christian, can I ask you a question? Do you have joy? I'm not asking, are you happy? Some of y'all remember the illustration years back. Happy. So you've got a whole new generation that doesn't even know this illustration. <laughs> I'm happy. Do I look happy to you? No. no. You're judging me. <laughs> because here's the thing. When you look like Scrooge and you act like Scrooge, <laughs> you're Scrooge. Joy. Do you have joy? A couple of thoughts. Really, there's three points to this message. One of all, helping joy. Number two, thrilling joy. And number three, number two, excuse me, helping joy, thrilling joy, and robbing joy. First of all, thrilling joy. Or excuse me, helping joy. Helping joy for what? Helping by God's presence. Are you happy? Are you joy? And again, I, I don't, I'm going to try to be very careful not to interchange the words joyful and happy because they are two different things. Happiness, again, is something that you, happens to you and you know you heard a good joke, therefore it makes you laugh. Joy is something that no matter what the circumstances of your life, you recognize that God is real. Folks, are you joyful that God's presence is in your life? See, here's the thing is, you have some people that say they're Christians but in all honesty, if they actually were in the presence of God, the way that they recognized that they were in the presence of God, the way that they really were, they wouldn't be happy. They wouldn't be joyful. They're, they're living their lives in such a way that to be in the presence of God is not comfortable. See, God, His presence, 
helps us to have joy. I would say this, where there is no grace, there is no joy. Number two, not only does helping joy help in God's presence, but also helping joy helps our perspective. I want you to take your Bibles and turn back to James chapter 1. I was, on a, I was on a plane coming home yesterday from Pensacola, and there was a woman, a seat back, and obviously it was her and her grown son. Son was probably in his 30s. Mom was probably in his, her 60s. She was just a cranky old... Don't, 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 if you're old, please do not say that. She was just a cranky old woman. By the way, there are cranky young people too. So it has nothing to do with age. She just happened to be older. The service came by and the woman had her purse in her, in her, in her lap. And if you've ever flown, you can't fly with anything in your lap. Purses, bags, things like that. I mean, if you've got your phone out, they don't have a problem with that. So the stewardess came by and just said, ma'am, you're going to need to put that purse under your, under your seat. And she kept on walking. And after the stewardess walked off, the woman, I'm not putting my bag under the seat. Why'd she single me out? She's profiling me. They were two different races, by the way. I'm not going to tell you which is which because it doesn't really matter. Because it had nothing to do with race. It had to do with law. I've, I've been on planes where the planes have, have you know, had hit air pockets and stuff, and stuff has gone flying. Pooh-ah! There's a reason for that. And this woman, for the next five minutes, is back there. I'm not putting my purse, my, my stuff's going to roll around this floor. I'm not going to let anything roll around the floor. My medicine will come out of my bag. I'm not, you say, you're, you're dramatizing. No, I'm underperforming. You got to remember, I was not right beside her. I was a couple of seats away. And so, you could, she was saying it loud enough that everybody around could hear. And finally, the lead stewardess came back and said, ma'am, you are going to have to put that bag under the seat or we cannot push away from the gate. Well, you're not telling anybody else. And she said, yes, ma'am, we're telling every single person. And she looked over at a woman that had, some, had, had picked her purse up to get something out of it. And she said, ma'am, and the woman said, was sitting in the same row, the woman said, I'm putting it right back, not a problem. You know what my heart broke? If that's how that woman lives her life, Something as silly as a purse being put under a seat would cause her to be so cantankerous that she thinks it's racial profiling or it's this or it's that. You know what that woman doesn't have? She doesn't have any joy. You see, it changes. When you get the love of God... He puts a joy in your heart, and when you get that joy, it changes your perspective. Things look so different when you have the joy of the Lord. Look at James chapter 1. Go down to verse 2. My brethren, count it all what? When ye fall into... Now, isn't it amazing? Look at the connection. Look at the connection. Joy... Now, what does the word divers mean? Does that mean you're going underwater? It means diverse. Divers means, that was an old English word. If you, if you okay, uh, how many of you have ever heard the term, but that, that, that restaurant's a dive. What does it mean? It means it's one that's out of the ordinary. It's kind of out of place. It, it became synonymous with kind of a dirty place. But that's, it, it has to do with the idea that it comes from the form divers in Old English, which the word divers means something that's diverse. That's where the word of diversity comes from. Diverse temptations. And I did some study about this, and what this is literally talking about is 
is an individual who's going through different temptations or trials at the same time. You know the troubles come in threes. Anybody ever know? Like sneezes. Right? How many of you know, how many of you heard that joke, sneezes come in threes? How many of you have th at least three? See, there you go. How many of you are like, I am not going to raise my hand no matter what ask. <laughs> Divers, he's talking here about people having different problems, more than one problem at a time. But notice what he says in verse 2. My brethren, and he doesn't say you're going to have joy. He says count it all joy. But then he tells us why. Look at verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith does what? In other words, what he's saying is this. He's saying that joy and patience are directly connected together. You see that? You can't separate joy from patience. Joy and patience are, are really flip sides of the same issue. It's the concept of saying, you know what? God is in control. Your life is not an accident. You're, like, you're not an oops. Aren't you glad you're not an oops? Amen. There's no such thing as oops. God does, didn't look down and go, oops. There's two places you don't want to hear oops. One is from God and the other is from your dentist. You don't hear your dentist go, oops. <laughs> By the way, you'll never, you'll never hear oops from God. Folks, you're not a mistake. You're not a mistake. The difficulties and problems of your life, they're not a mistake. So what are they there for? He tells you. So that you can have patience and joy. You say, well, I don't have joy. I would have joy if I didn't have problems. No, you'd have happiness. When you don't have problems, you can have happiness. But joy is changing of the perspective. Uh, take your Bibles and go back to Romans chapter 8. Again, this is a verse that I know you know well. Some of you have it memorized, but bear with me. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says what? And we know that what? All things work together for what? To them that love God, to them who are the called according to what? In other words, God has a purpose for your life. Look, things don't just happen. I understand. I, I was, the other day, I can't remember where it was, I saw this, one of the lottos, maybe New York. Their tagline is, hey, you never know. Is that New York's lotto? Is it? Or at least, it, hey, you never know. I know. I know I'm not going to win. <laughs> Can I tell you how I know I'm not going to win? Because I ain't playing. <laughs> That's how I know I'm not going to win. I'm not playing. I've got five bucks in my pocket and I'm not giving it to Governor Cuomo through the lotto. I may give it to him for taxes, but I ain't going to give him to the lotto. Here's the thing. There's no accidents. I understand we have free will. I understand people have free will and things that they do toward us. I get that. This whole message within itself. But here's what joy does. It changes our perspective. It helps us to understand that Christ is in control. That all things really do work together for good. Even those things that we look at and say, how could this be good? God says, I'm working it for good. By the way, it does not say in this verse that everything is good. It says everything works together for good. The end result is good, not the individual elements. You've heard me use the cake illustration, so I'm not going to go there. But I want to look at one other verse. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. 
See, what does joy do? It helps us. It's, it's helping joy. It helps us into God's presence. It helps us to gain perspective. If you want to say God's perspective, you could say that. 1 Peter chapter 4, go down if you would for sake of time. Let's just go, go right down to verse 12. 1 Peter 4, 12, it says, Beloved. By the way, that's a good word. Especially in context of what he's about to say. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding, what? There it is. The end result. Can I ask a question? Was Jesus Christ dying on the cross a good thing? Okay, let me try that again. The answer is yes. I'll help you out for those that are struggling with the answer. Was Jesus Christ dying on the cross a good thing? Yes. Was it a good thing for him? No. It was when it was done. Remember, that's what it said. It talks about the fact that Jesus saw the joy that was set before him. Because what did Jesus do? He recognized that it's the truth of the faith that worketh patience. It's not the trial that's good. It's the end result of the trial. It's the end result. See, it's the end result. That, now, what are you going to do with the end result? Well, that's up to you. You're going to get bitter. You're going to get better. You're going to look and say, oh, I can't believe God put that into my life. Or, God, you must be teaching me something good. I wonder what's going to... When this is all said and done, I wonder. I wonder what God's doing in my life. On Friday morning, I got to go with the girls down to downtown Pensacola. I, even the years we were there, I rarely went to downtown Pensacola. And no, I did not live at the beach. Just to put that in your mind. When I was young, I had two colors. White and red. Skin. I, I was either... I, I actually, I wasn't even white. I was transparent. My hair was white, not gray. That didn't happen until I came here. It's white. Because it bleached out in the sun. But I went down to 10 Pensacola with the girls, and, and uh, I went, and we were walking down the street, and I looked up, and there was the jeweler's trade shop. And I went, they're still open. And I walked in, it was a jewelry store that I bought the loose diamond and the two sapphires that are on my wife's engagement ring. And I had to make her, wet, her engagement ring and got 30 some years. And I walked in and the place almost looked exactly like it did. And I said, is the, I, I, this girl walked up, she says, can I help you? And I said, I just wanted to walk in. I told her the story. And she said, well, that's really nice. I appreciate you coming in and telling us. And she said, so I guess the wedding ring worked out for you. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know about the wedding ring, but the wife did. <laughs> I said, yeah, the wedding ring worked out fine. On my wife's wedding ring that I got at that store, there's a diamond. Do you know how a diamond is created? Heat and pressure. I'm sure that if that diamond, that lump of coal, which is where it starts from, under heart, under heat, and under pressure, if it could tell you, you know what, I'm looking forward to being a diamond. But when it's all said and done, it's precious. Helping joy. Now take your Bibles and go back to 1 Samuel chapter 18. Not only is there helping joy... But there's thrilling joy. Now, I understand this is not a charismatic church, and obviously if it was, I wouldn't be pastoring. But I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that being saved should be, at times, thrilling. We should be happy about it. We shouldn't be walking around like I was teasing the guys earlier. Do I look happy? 
My dad used to say it this way. If you're saved, let your face know it. Look if you would here in, in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Let's go down to verse 6. Or verse 5, for sake of context. What's happened is, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 5, sorry. What's happened is, is, is there's been a great victory. And look at verse 5. It says, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. In other words, he was, David was beloved by all. There was only one person in the country who didn't like him. Anybody know who that was? Saul. And the reason that Saul didn't like him is because he was what? He was jealous. He was jealous and afraid of him. He, 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 was, he was concerned that David was going to take over the country. David was as loyal to Saul as anybody he had. But Saul was afraid, and jealous, and fearful. Look at verse 6. It came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, slinging and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments and music. Why were they doing that? They were happy. Don't overlook it. They were excited. Yesterday, again, or for Thursday morning, one of the, the beforehand, Dr. Rushing, who heads up the ministerial department, he said, all right, he says, I'm going to take five guys, I'm going to give you ten seconds to give me a praise. He said, don't normally do this, we don't have any announcements, so I'm going to take five guys, ten seconds apiece to give me a praise. A couple guys gave praises, one of the guys raised his hand, he says, I got to lead my roommate to the Lord last night. That place came unglued. All those guys started, look, look, preacher boys class. They started all shouting, hey, man, glory, hallelujah, hey, amen, amen. So, oh, we shouldn't do that. Why not? Now, I understand we ought to be under control. I get it. And some of you are not shouters. I get that. Please don't walk the backs of the chairs, especially these. <laughs> you'll only try it once, trust me. Down you'll go. There is a thrilling joy here. Now, again, now that's not the only element. But the reality is, is, is in a sense, there's a, if you look at this here in verse 6, you can read it and there's almost like there's an aura. When you read the words in verse 6, these women are coming out to meet him and they're, they're, they're with tabrets, with joy, with instruments, with music. You can literally hear the aura. They're excited, they're thrilled. When was the last time you got that about the things of the Lord? See, there's a joy. Go back to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Not only is there you know, something that's kind of, kind of an aura, an outward show, display, if you will, but there's also physical excitement. Look at Acts chapter 3. And it says in verse 1, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of praying, being the ninth hour. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried when they laid him at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I will tell you this, I have a feeling this man probably appreciated what he was given by Peter and John than if they had given him money. Because look at the next thing. Verse 7. And he took him up by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. He busted up the church service. He went into the temple leaping and jumping and praising God. I don't think he did it quietly. I'm not going to do it. But can you imagine what it would be like to be a cripple and all of a sudden now you can walk? 
And not only can you walk, stop and think about it this way. He goes from not just walking, he goes to leaping and jumping. I want you to think about this for a second. Think about the great miracle that this is. Not just the fact that God gave him the ability to walk. God gave him the ability to leap and jump. That meant that he gave him, the, he gave him total muscle structure back. How many of you have ever had, where, where, um, anybody ever had who's had a, had a cast on recently? Anybody in the room had a cast on recently? <laughs> Adina over here. She doesn't have a cast on anymore. I'll tell you this. If you've ever had a broken leg and you've had a cast on for any period of time, after you get that cast off, it's kind of tentative. This man from, went from being not able to walk to leaping and jumping. This isn't just some simple miracle of, oh, now he can walk. He can leap and jump. He's thrilled. He's excited. It's thrilling joy. Go back to John chapter 15. Look at John chapter 15. Look at verse 8. Jesus is talking about being in Christ, being in Him, being part of the true vine. And He says in, in, in John chapter 15, verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. And by the way, notice the connection between His love and joy. In just a second here. Because remember, look at the fruit. Remember the fruit? What's the first part of the fruit in, in, in Galatians chapter six, or Galatians chapter 5? Okay, what's the second one? Okay, look, they're connected right here. They're connected there and they're connected here. He says, if you, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. There's a direct connection between understanding the love of God and the joy that he's talking about. And it's interesting if you were to look at this, this idea of this joy, this is, again, it's, it's an active joy. It's not just this joy of, uh, look, I feel it, because if you look here in John chapter 15, what is he saying? Because you love me, what are you going to do? You're going to keep my commandments. You're going to do what I, what I want you to do. Can I tell you something? I don't have a problem going to church. I'm not trying to be mean towards you, okay? Please do not get angry with me, but I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to be really plain. I'm supposed to tell the truth because I'm in church. I like going to church. Yeah, because you get to preach and step on everybody else's toes. I'd like to go to church when somebody else is stepping on mine. And it's not always stepping on toes. Sometimes it's being encouraged. Folks, I ask you a question. Look, if you're here, you go, you know, I, I don't always, I, I don't like going to church. Can I ask you why? You need to answer that question, why? Well, it's because you preach too long. Okay. Come Sunday afternoon, I preach shorter. Come Wednesday night, I even preach shorter there. Come to Sunday school. Hint, hint, hint. I'm on the clock. Look, I got a question. Why don't we go, why don't we enjoy that? Well, to be honest with you, it's because sometimes it's because we have a greater love for something else than we do the Word of God. See, here, you're going to find that when we love God and His Word, there's a joy there. You go together. It's thrilling. But let's go back to Psalm 51. Not only is, this, there, is there helping joy and thrilling joy, but when I say robbing joy, I don't mean that there is a joy that robs us. I'm saying there are things that rob us of our joy. So here's what I want to do. For the, last, for the next few minutes, and then I will be done. I want to I go over real quickly, what are some things that rob us of our joy? 
Well, look at, at Psalm 51. And look down, if you would, at verse 12. Here you have David writing, and he says, down in verse 12, Restore unto me the what? Of thy salvation. You know why he lost his joy? Because of sin. The sin he's talking about here, actually, my, 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 yours may not have this as kind of a subheading, but under Psalm 51, mine says that my, my Bible says this, A plea for forgiveness to the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. This is, Psalm 51, is David's prayer, praying to God, Lord, I've sinned against you, and I want you to restore the joy of my salvation. What had stolen his joy? His own sin. Can you be honest enough can you, will, will you be honest enough to say that maybe the reason you do not have the joy of the Lord is because there's some sin that's robbing you of it? Is that possible? Is it possible that there may be, you know, I don't have the joy of the Lord. I'm saved. I know that I'm saved. I, I truly believe that I'm saved. I know that I'm saved, but I don't have that joy. Is it possible that you've let a sin get so seated into your life that it's stealing your joy? Second of all, take your Bibles and turn back to Philippians chapter 4. Not only will sin steal or rob our joy, but conflict, strife. Look at Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 1. He says, Therefore, my beloved, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast, in the Lord, my dearly beloved, I beseech Eudeus and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat you, the also true yoke fellows, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also and these other. And what he's talking about here is he's saying, look, there, there was a conflict going on. There was strife within the church. So in verse 2, he's telling him, look, I, I, I hope that Eudeus and Syntyche, look, that, they're, that he, they can be of the same mind. Because what happens is, is strife and conflict steals that joy away. That's why you have, look down at verse 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always, and what? He's telling these people, look, as long as you have strife and conflict between each other, it's going to steal your joy away. Can I, can I ask you a question? Is it possible? It's just possible that the reason you don't have joy, the joy of the Lord in your life, that there's somebody or multiple somebodies that you have chosen or whatever that you're not getting along with. You've got conflict with them. Maybe it's in your home. Maybe it's with your kids. Maybe it's with your parents. Maybe it's with somebody at work. Maybe it's somebody at church. Maybe it's with the preacher. And you've got a strife and a conflict going on. And you know what? It's stealing your joy. Well, can I tell you this? Until you get rid of the strife, you're not going to get the joy back. Strife. How about this? Go back to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. What are some things that steal our joy? Well, sin. Strife. Look at James chapter 3. Okay. He's talking here in this whole passage about having godly wisdom. It starts in verse 13, goes down to verse 18. But I want you to notice specifically for sake of time, look at verse 16. He says, where envying and strife is, there is confusion. That word confusion is, is and, and again, I'm not going to take the time to do this because we're, we're, I'm watching time, but the Greek word confu that deals with this word confusion is, an, how many of you know what an antonym is? An antonym, okay. An antonym is the opposite of something. If I said that is, it, that is cold, the antonym of that is, okay. If I said, you know, you are pretty, but he is, that's the antonym, Okay. It was funny, Hannah was saying that they went down some Beauty and the Beast, they had a Beauty and the Beast breakfast when they were on their honeymoon. And I said, well, now that you and Marshall are married, that's every breakfast. 
Marshall hasn't heard it yet. He may have heard it now. now every breakfast with him is now Beauty and the Beast. But here's the thing. An antonym is something that's the opposite. You see the word confusion? The root word is actually the antonym of joy. So what he's saying in verse 16, for where ending in strife is, there is a robber of joy. Something that steals away that joy. What causes it? Well, he tells us in verse 16, the first part of it, the two words that he uses are envying and strife. You know, you know a synonym for antonym? Or, a, excuse me, a synonym for envying? Selfishness. Covetousness kind of is the same word, but it's the idea of looking what somebody has and wanting that and saying, I want that for myself. What does it do? It steals... Is it possible? Now, I'm just asking. I'm, I'm, I'm not being commentary because I don't know your life the way that God knows your life. But is it possible that the reason you don't have the joy of the Lord in your life is because you've been living a selfish life and what you've been ending about and what you've been wanting is stealing the joy of the Lord from your life? Go back to Hebrews chapter 12. And look, if you would, down at verse 15. He says in verse 15, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Now, by the way, where is this root of bitterness springing up, springing up? In somebody else or in yourself? In yourself, in your own heart. And it says again, and thereby many be defiled. I like what one preacher called this. He called this the sourest verse in the Bible. The sourest verse in the Bible. Why? Because it's an individual who allows their joy, their, if you will, their own bitter heart and spirit to destroy them from within. See, it's one thing to let somebody else who you have no control over to let them, because you can't control whether they're going to do right or wrong towards you or not. In this verse, this is an individual who says, you know what? I'm going to let bitterness stay in my life. I'm going to let that unforgiveness stay in my life. And I'm going to let it sour me. The other day, we were, we were doing some cleaning out. Actually, I wasn't. My wife was. But I walked into the room and she was looking at something. And I had bought an, a, a packet when I was doing low carb, these, a packet of these pickles. That are, I can't remember what they're called, but it's a, like a foil bag that's sealed at the top, and they've got 15, 20 pickles in them. And they have zero carbs. Well, she picked it up, and she, I saw, she moved it, and I, I looked at it, and I thought, that's weird. It looks like one of those pickles. So I picked it up, and sure enough, it was one of those pickles. And it had ballooned out like a pillow. And I looked at it, and I said, I thought those were supposed to be refrigerated. So I flipped the bag around, and sure enough, it says, keep refrigerated. And I thought, I wonder if these are, I'm thinking, and then I looked at the date, Best Buy, it was like 2018 or something. I can tell you this, if I opened that bag up, those dill pickles would have been sour. Because you, know you know what those pickles have been doing? They've been festering in their own juices. They've been festering in their own juices. That's what this is talking about. An individual who's festering in their own juices. They're bitter in their own heart. I'm going to tell you, bitterness will just steal your joy away. And let me show you one last one. Go back to Proverbs chapter 12. What can steal our joy? Well, sin can. Strife can. Selfishness can. Sourness can. I, and I had down in my notes fear, but you could actually, if you want to keep it alliterated, scared. Look at Proverbs chapter 12. Do you know that fear, fear robs you of your joy? Look at verse 25. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good work maketh it 
And that word heaviness there has to do with the idea of allowing burdens to keep piling on top of you and instead of letting them go. You ever, you ever had an argument with your spouse that they brought up something or you brought up something from five years ago? Here's the problem with that. What, is that. what does that tell your spouse? If you bring up something from five years ago, what has that told your spouse you've been carrying for five years? You've been carrying that burden on you. Instead of letting it go, you've been allowing that thing to remain on your back. Why? Probably because you've been afraid to get rid of it, because you're afraid of letting it go. And that's really what this word heaviness has to do. It's, it's the idea of, well, the best way to how to describe it, I've, I've said this before, the Hebrew language is a wonderfully expressive language, but it has a lot of emotion in it. Again, this was something that Jonathan Kaiser and I were talking about, about the fact that the, the Greek language is very precise. If you mistranslate the Greek language, you're doing it on purpose. They're in here. <laughs> Blue's online, a police car just went by. When he says here in verse 25, heaviness, it's the idea of a hoarder. Okay? How many of you have ever seen these television shows that talk about hoarders? Why are they hoarding? Why are they afraid to let go of stuff? Because they're afraid that one day they'll need it. And there'll come a day that they need it and they don't that's, that's what this word heaviness has to do with. It has to do with the fact of keeping a hold of things because you're afraid that one day you'll need it. But notice what that kind of heaviness does. That heaviness in the heart of man, it makes it, the heart, stoop. I used to say, and I want you to go back as we close here to Galatians chapter 5, Notice what he says in Galatians 5.22, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, and then what? Joy. Joy. All right? Let me give it to you as simply as I can. What is joy? I've heard it said this way. I, I heard it said, and I've said for years, until I read something actually just a week or two ago, and I like it better, but I used to say that joy was real simple. It was an acronym. Jesus, others, and yourself. Well, that's pretty good. But I found a better one. The J and the Y do stand for Jesus and you. But think of the, Z, the O as a zero. What's between you and Jesus? Nothing. I like it better. Because that's really what joy... Because can I tell you this? Sometimes you don't get joy from others. Matter of fact, truth be known, you really don't ever get joy from others. Not the kind of biblical joy we're talking about. Not the kind of biblical joy we're talking about. But you do get this kind of joy from who? From the Lord. When there's nothing between... I'm trying to remember... Let me see. I just, it just hit me just a minute ago. Yeah, somebody said it. I don't think it's I don't think it's in our hymn book. Is it? What's the title of it? Oh, yep, yeah, there it is. Everybody do me a favor. Grab your hymn books and turn to number 464. And here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to do this two ways. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, it would be a privilege and a joy to talk to you about that. Really what? If you sit here and say, you know what, I, I've never had the joy of the Lord in my life. Well, I'll tell you where that joy starts. It starts with getting saved. It's where it starts. It's not where it finishes, it's just where it starts. So if you're here this morning, you never trusted Christ as your Savior. Can I tell you this? He wants to give you joy. He doesn't want to just give you some kind of passing happiness. He wants to give you an everlasting joy. How does he do that? He does it by showing you his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Well, that's where the joy starts. By his showing of his love. So if you're here this morning, it would be our privilege to show you. And so when we, what we're going to do in just a second, we're going to actually sing this song as a kind of an invitation 
prayer, dedication, however I want to say that. And if you're here this morning, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, it would be a privilege and a joy to talk to you right now. If, you want to, if you're willing to step out of the seat and come up the aisle, take you to a quiet place and show you from the Bible how you can have nothing between your soul and the Savior, we would gladly do that. So let me encourage you. Think about what God would have you to do. Take your hymn books, 464. Let's stand together. I'm going to have my wife come and play. Or Becky, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, Becky, go ahead. I'm not taking away from her. I forgot. I was thinking Becky couldn't play yet, but she played last week, right? 464, nothing between my soul and the Savior. And this is really what joy is. Joy is when there's nothing between us and the Lord. And that's what we're going to sing. That's 464. Again, if you're here this morning you know, and you want to know Christ as your Savior, let us talk with you. It'd be a privilege and a joy. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine, there's nothing between, nothing between my soul and Savior, so that His blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the beast of His favor, keep the way clear, let nothing be seen. On the last one. Trusting his word, let us watch and pray, watch and pray. Rejoicing in hope, for he cometh quickly, haste to 